Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Kristen, a clerk in the Franklin County Public Library, and today I have gathered some fascinating minds in sort of a library roundtable um, with yours truly as the moderator. Um, this is going to be broken into two different programs. The first program, part one, we are going to talk about management of libraries and the different ways that different titles, how the boards work, those kinds of things. And then we're gonna move into funding, how libraries are funded, how they're budgeted, what the budget um, has to cover. Um, the second part of the program uh, will be about programming. I know, hope some of you have uh, taken advantage of your library programs. So we're gonna talk a little about those programs, how they come together, and community partnerships. Um, a lot of libraries do have partner, are important to their communities because of these partnerships. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then I'm gonna ask these guys to give me a look into the future of libraries, where they think uh, libraries are going as an institution. Um, and then we're gonna wrap up. So hopefully um, all of you will get some information that you didn't have before. Um, and some information that you were looking for. Um, and I'm gonna start with, we'll start with Justin. Um, how important is it that libraries offer programming? I mean, we already have, we have materials. What else do you people need? <laughs> well, I, programs are needed to pull people in to remind them that we are not just a pile of books with a roof on it that when you bring these people in this is where they can exist without expectation of payments that you know we're not starbucks we're not walmart we're not any other place we're the only game in town where you can just come and be a part of us without any kind of expectation. Um, there is no payment involved. Uh, in, in Houston, there was a huge expectation, especially from our Hispanic population, that thought that it was like a club or a membership, that how much do I need to pay for a library card? And it's like, no, it's, it's free. And everything that we can do in the library is free, yes. I mean, aside from printing, but like that's still super cheap too. But the idea that you could take your kids in to do a story time or that they could make their own bubble bath or that you can make your own lip scrub, what your own scarf, whatever the, 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 the program is, um, it's a way to get people in and to not only have them, you know, have that warm, cuddly feeling of, you know, associating warm stuff with the library and building on those memories and the things that you do in the library, but it's also a good way to, you know, make it sticky that once you've got them in the building, hey, if you enjoyed this kids program, did you know that we got summer reading going on? We have all these eBooks that your kids might be interested in. We offer all these other fun things and services that may be of use to you. Um, my background is also an MBA. So I'm always thinking from the CEO business side as well, that like, okay, we got them in the building. How else do we get them? You know, <laughs> evil genius plan to take over their, their entire schedule. I got to keep them coming back for more. Uh, to me, that's, that's what, that's what the programming is. It's the gateway to all the other fun stuff that libraries have to offer. Claire, would you agree with that? Uh, yes, hundred percent. So I definitely think that programming sort of allows you to create sort of micro communities within your library community because are you interested in you know something artistic we have something for that do you want to create lifelong feelings of library happiness bring your kids to a story time and be part of that and I just or like our book club for example that's how I met Kristen is she came to my romance book club that I host for Red Deer Public Library just randomly and now I have a romance book friend and so <laughs> It's all these like little micro communities that are created through shared interests or shared passions that you can partake at the library for no cost. And, you know, hopefully in a place that you feel safe and comfortable and, and want to come back to. Now, Susan, uh, I follow your library on Facebook um, and I've been seeing uh, notices for the summer concert series. I believe you'll be doing. So your programming is kind of on a grand scale. Um, I think of how important is having those big events to both you as a library director and to your patrons? So the mission of our library is to enrich our community through lifelong learning and discovery. And I feel that programming 
supports that because people learn in different ways. And many people learn from reading a book or listening to a book, but you also learn from hearing a concert. You learn from participating in a craft program. You learn from going to our makerspace to do 3D printing or vinyl cutting. So I think programming supports those different types of experiences and those different ways people learn. It also allows us to take the message and the power of the library outside the walls of the library through outreach programming, which I know all of us participate in. Um, one of our more recent outreach program success stories is that we are going to um, apartment complexes within the Fort Wayne Housing Authority to do hands-on computer training and digital literacy training with the residents there. So teaching them how to use laptops, teaching them how to use tablets. So programming is a way to get that message out and bring the library to people who may not um, be able to experience us in traditional ways through barriers like transportation, work hours, things like that. Now, Tammy, being a rural library, um, you've got the three branches um, there. How, can, how do you decide what program is gonna be at which branch? How do you decide what's gonna be in Maine, what's gonna be in Calvert? Or is that dependent on the staff that works there? Yeah, it's really dependent on the staff. And to build on, I just want to say, build on what Susan said, That's libraries cool. are about um, equal access to mm -hmm. lifelong learning. And like a hundred years ago, books were a really rare commodity. And so making books available to the masses was a big deal. But now it's, you know, those kids who the kids with money, their parents can take them to museums, can take them to the zoo. The kids who are without, whose, you know, family may don't, may not have that time or money. We give them that opportunity by bringing in the animals to the library and letting them visit them there and learn about them. Um, and so it is, programming is just furthering our mission and meeting the new demands. And so in Marshall County, even though it's a small community, each of our three communities that our buildings located in are very different from each other and their needs are very different from each other. And so um, we allow each branch to decide on their own programming because of that. You know, what's needed in Hardin is not the same as what's needed in Calvert City. Those are com two completely different places. And so what might be attended, um, what you know, people might be interested in what age group may even attend. It's completely different. Um, so that's how that's decided is just what that particular community needs. And we try to meet that however we can. Now, I know, I believe everyone has, I know that Marshall will crack in, I believe Alan as well, have a bookmobile. I don't know if, I don't remember if you see your bookmobile, but you have the pop-up at your local mall, right? Yes. How, how important is it to, do you take that bookmobile, take that, your pop-up and you can reach people in different places? Um, we have, I know here in, Kentucky, uh, here in Paducah, we just take our bookmobile, we took it to the farmer's market last weekend and people could check out there because they were at the farmer's market, they could check out there um, and I believe I'm not sure they can return there, but they can, I know they could check out there. But taking the library to people, is that a factor when you're deciding on what programs you're doing? Anyone? I mean, I think, I, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tammy. Oh, sorry. Honestly, Marshall is now trying to set, follow the example Susan set at McCracken. Um, when Susan first came to McCracken, she completely changed how that library looked at outreach. And, um, you know, they were no longer bound by a building. And we don't want to be bound by a building either, because there are people who will never walk through these doors. But that doesn't mean that they don't deserve library services. And so um, we have been over the two years that COVID was really hot and heavy, we spent a lot of time planning and thinking of what that was going to look like. And this spring, we have really started 
acting on that, um, going out into the community more, being more, more visible um, in other places and places where people might not expect the library to be um, and doing things that work with the mission of wherever we are. We went to the Woo Festival last weekend, um, which is kind of this hippie free spirit festival that they have here in Marshall County, very well attended. And so our children's librarians were there and they were helping kids make um, those little seed bombs, you know, oh, where you cute. kind of throw them somewhere and the wildflowers bloom. And, um, you know, and we were, we signed up people for library cards that day. And these were people who may not have thought they had an interest in the library before. They did not realize that we have something for them as well as whoever they thought our target market was. Claire, did you have something to add? Yeah, definitely um, outreach opportunities or us being at the mall, for example. So many people will walk by, look at us in the mall, look up at our sign, look at us again, and come in and be like, you're the library? Yes, can we get you a library card? And they'll be like, oh, I haven't been to the library in 15 years. I've never had a library card, whatever it is. And then they're like, this is so cool. And so yeah, outreach opportunities to allow people to sort of meet or to allow us to meet people where they are versus constantly you know, hoping that they find us or that they hear us through the noise of social media and, and all of that. Like it's, yeah, we like any children's festivals that come up, we have this thing in Red Deer called Festival of Trees around Christmas time, um, which is a huge outreach opportunity for us. And you can, you know, do your children's programming, set up library cards for the whole family and just do everything. So I think outreach opportunities are a huge reason that libraries will like move forward because I think libraries are really good at sort of changing with the times. Yes, one of the things I, yeah, that's a, that's a really thought provoking statement you made there. Libraries are good with changing with the times. When we went, uh, Kentucky, our governor shut everything down in March, 2020. Um, we all pivoted to working from home and one of the things that our library did that Susan led us to do and that we still do today is programming on Facebook, uh, which wasn't something we really looked at doing before, really thought about doing before. And it was really fast that we had some programming out there. I think my favorite program that we did, one of our uh, employees is an accomplished singer songwriter and he put on a program from his house and he played music and he told stories and those were like appointment viewing for the times that he did it um, and all of you have a social media presence Susan is that proved a boon to your library being on Instagram being on Facebook maybe being on TikTok or have you been able to see the kind of, are you been able to see results from that? I think that it's definitely expanded our reach. So one thing that is unique about our library and Kristen, you really need to make a field trip is our genealogy center. Yes. So I want to see we, that. Yes. We are the largest public library genealogy collection in the country. The only bigger genealogy collection in a library in the country is the LDS library in Salt Lake, which is not a public library. So this is really the crown in our jewel. And programming, particularly virtual programming, has opened up the audience to our resources to the globe. Um, virtual programming still does really well for us, particularly when it comes to genealogy. We have commonly audiences of 500 people to our virtual programs when it comes to genealogy, and they can come from as far away as Australia. Wow. Yes, so we thank you, technology. Thank you, social media. Thank you, Zoom, for making our resources known worldwide. And I don't think that something probably five years ago we would have, as a library community, would have even thought either about doing or that it would be successful. Uh, when you put on programs, you decide on these programs, Cammie, do you think, how do you judge if it's successful or do you judge if it's successful? Is the success just that it was put on 
and that one mom and toddler came? I think that is one of the hardest things for public library is how to measure success because we aren't a factory. <laughs> you know, it's not, you can't qu quantify things with numbers. Um, sometimes it's the smallest thing that you do in your day that makes the biggest difference and impact in somebody's life. Um, so it's really hard to say, you know, which program's successful and which one's not. Now, obviously, when they're pulling in big numbers, we know, okay, this is something the community's interested in. This is something we might want to repeat in the future. This is something we may want to repeat at various branches, whatever the case may be. Um, but then we have smaller programs. We have um, one where we have a staff member available in like our little computer classroom. And pe people can come by during these certain hours and just ask any question they might have for one-on-one -on -one assistance that may take a while. Maybe yeah. one person comes in every time we do it. You know what I'm saying? Right. But it's super important to that one person. And it's not costing us anything to put this on. You know, you do have to look at, did you just spend a ton of money and nobody show up? <laughs> but I mean, if it's something that's not costing you something, but like two hours of a staff member's time, and it's making a large impact on an individual, why not? Why not indeed? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now I know Justin McCracken has what I think of as community, community partnerships um, where say Merriman House, United Way, uh, the health department will reach out to us and we do something um, together. For example, right now we, the, Health department is enabling us to offer Narcan um, to anyone who comes in and would like to have some, take some, because they thought it'd be easier to get at the library, that they'd be more comfortable at the library than stay at the health department. How important are these community partnerships that we do kind of all, is it, and is it more important, as Susan, I want you to think about this, I'll get to you. Is it more important in a smaller community than in a larger area to have community partnerships, or does it matter? I think it's absolutely vital to have them no matter what the size. Um, uh, proportionally, you're still going to have community partners that will reach the places that you don't go, um, go the places that you can't, whether it's you just don't have the, the time, the staff, the whatever to go to things, because given that library staff have a limited number of staff, we can only be so many places at once. Having those community partnerships allows you to be in all of those other places that you can't be in that moment. So if you are if you are doing things that um, you wouldn't ordinarily do, like medically uh, with the Purchase Health District or uh, things like Merriman House, um, being able to do volunteer services or be able to provide other things, those partnerships allow you to be more and do more as you work together. And it also gets their name out there. It gets your name out there and everybody wins. Uh, you know, United Way, they may do things that people didn't know and they wind up going, oh, gee, I didn't know that United Way also offered that. I didn't know that Merriman had this and this and this other thing. I just thought they were just this one organization that offered this one thing and vice versa, their people also learn, hey, library is not a pile of books with a roof on it. They learned <laughs> something else about us too. Susan, is that a community partnerships is important in your area? I'm just thinking this because you serve a lot of people. <laughs> with that, that's what my thinking is that may be a little different. Equally important. In some ways, I think it's a little more challenging to achieve community partnerships in larger communities. Um, just the landscape is a little noisier sometimes. And I think in smaller communities, there's more of a sense of we're in this together kind of way. We've got to work together. We're smaller, and but we're mighty. We've got to pool resources that you may not see as much in larger communities. But that being said, it's a very robust part of what we do here. And something that has just started that I've been so thrilled with. Um, we do once a month something called Connect Allen County, where we bring here at our main library multiple 
social service providers. We have somebody from an HIV clinic. We have somebody who deals with food insecurity, with um, medical assistance, all under one roof. So it's kind of a one-stop shop for anybody who needs those services. So they can come to the library, benefit from library services, but also go table to table to learn about what resources are available to them, particularly those who are experiencing poverty or who are currently unhoused. So it just brings everybody under one roof. And what's also kind of fun to see is that the organizations, and I'm sure you all have seen this when you're out doing outreach as well, the organizations network with one another. So you're reaching to the patrons, but you learn about a group in town who's doing this kind of work that you didn't know existed. So that's another tool in your toolbox to refer patrons to. It's another avenue for additional partnerships. It's a big part of what we do. Yeah, I, and I do think um, the community, those services benefit from having our hands as well because like they can reach people we can't. Sometimes we can reach people they can't. You know, and also, yeah, and a place like a library too it is so accessible. There are people who, for whatever reasons, would not be comfortable going to a church for services, mm -hmm. going to a school, wouldn't feel like it was a place for them. But everybody comes to the library. Um, it's the great equalizer in community spaces. You have the pillars of society. And you have those who are experiencing homelessness all within one roof, all being treated with the same level of dignity and respect. I think you see that in a lot of other public spaces. So you have that intersection that you just don't have in other places in the community. And several of our partners have mentioned that, that they just see such a wide cross-section of the community in places that are easy to find, that have good parking that are comfortable, that are clean, that are accessible. So it's a win-win for our partners as well. Claire, what kind of community partnerships do you guys have to the great north? Um, <laughs> we have quite a few depending on um, the different sort of areas. We have something here called Primary Care Network. So that's like a health service type of thing. So they use our channels, so like our social medias, to do talks on nutrition or postpartum depression or whatever it might be. Um, we have partnerships with a lot of like local businesses that are always like really generous with their time and sometimes money and spaces for us to like go out in the world and connect with an audience that maybe we wouldn't see at the library for whatever reason. Um, my favorite for that is I host a trivia night at a local restaurant here. And we're going to start up again after COVID, which I'm really excited about. But all of like, because we are smaller, like Red Deer is very, um, very community based. It's very support local. It's, it's just very that. So to have different community partnerships, um, I think you find an audience that you wouldn't have found in your building. They find an audience in your building that maybe didn't feel comfortable going to theirs because Maybe they're just this one thing and somebody doesn't want to be seen walking in through those doors, but you walk in through the doors of the library, you're just going to the library and it doesn't matter sort of what you're there for. No one can really tell you're there for whatever thing. So I think that the community partnerships just as an offshoot of sort of outreach and what that can mean, you know, five years down the road, 10 years down the road for what that means for your community, I think is huge. Uh, now, Tammy, I know that you are part of, I believe, the Chamber of Commerce there in Marshall. Um, how you're you're the face of the library, so how I am I would think of it being, being the director of the library, being the leader of the library, you're kind of the face of the library. How important is it for you to be in those spaces, such as something that you wouldn't normally think you would need a library presence? I think it's incredibly important for the library to be anywhere that there's a group of people making decisions about the community. Um, I really do. And so I'm there most of the time. Something very different from Marshall, even from McCracken, is 
and this is, sounds so quaint, but we really know each other here. You know, like we really all know each other. And I made the joke the other day that there's the same 15 people that show up to different, you know, like we just meet in different buildings and have different conversations because it's the <laughs> same 15 people serving on every committee in Marshall County. But, you know, it's important for us to be there. I said when I took this job that what I wanted Marshall County Public Library to become was the answer to every question in Marshall County. Like when somebody had something they needed help, the first person they called was me. And I really think we're making movements that way. I'm going to tell your TV story now, Kristen. You do. I love it. <laughs> so a couple of months ago, we received a phone call from somebody in the community that said, hey, don't you have a TV on wheels? And we were like, yeah, yeah, we've got, you know, a, like a mobile TV cart thing. And they were like, yeah, we need to borrow that. And we're like, we really don't really check that out to people. It's not got like a bark, uh, you know, and they were like, um, but the president of the United States is the one requesting it. And we're like, well, Joe Biden doesn't have a card, but we'll let him use it. Um, and so uh, President Biden was coming to Mayfield uh, to survey the tornado damage and um, talk. And so the TV was needed, I guess, as a teleprompter or something. I'm not even sure what they were using it for. But we somebody came, picked it up, took it to him. Um, a couple of days later, I talked about it to you guys like, hey, where's our TV that the president borrowed? And he's like, you know what? I don't know. Let's go make a call. And so we called the person who had talked to us and they were like, um, about that TV, it got commandeered by the uh, Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> so um, had to send the White House an overdue notice and <laughs> we do have our TV back now, but I love that when they came to this problem, their first thought was, let's call the library. I bet they can take care of this. And we could, and we were able to do that. Um, Marshall County has experienced crisis after crisis. Um, we had a school shooting in 2018. We, of course, everybody's gone through COVID together. We had the tornado. We just had an officer shooting in like the middle of town. It, it's, it's really been one tragedy after another here. And the library being in those spaces where we talk about how do we recover from that? How do we get past this? How do we move on? I think has been very important. Um, you know, a lot of times pop-up counseling gets scheduled here because it's a central place where you can send everybody and we have plenty of room to do it. And um, they bring in the therapy dogs or they bring in this or that and we become the central place where people are coming for resources now in these times of crisis because we have been in the room every time there's been a conversation about what resources are available in this community and so you know I, you've offered things and so yeah. they know what the library can do yeah they they know i mean every time somebody says hey, is there a place where we can? And I'm always like, me, <laughs> you know, where can we get me? <laughs> you know, like bring it to, you know, we can do that. I mean, it's part of what we do every day. We're not doing something special for these people. This is just who we are. It's what we do. Well, I don't know if you agree with that as far as your library's importance to your community as being a bit of a hub in your community, in your communities. Yeah, a real lifeline, and I know the story is not unique to us. You experience it at your libraries as well, but during peak COVID, during the shutdown, people were parked in our parking lots using our Wi-Fi, and they wouldn't have gotten their homework done. They wouldn't have been able to do their work had they not had the Wi-Fi at the library. I was talking to a patron in one of our rural libraries a few months ago who was still doing remote work. And she works for a major employer in town, but lives in the country, does not have strong broadband. She told me I would not be able to do my job if I wasn't able to come to the library and use your Wi-Fi. So it's been a real lifeline. 
real driver of the local economy. And that's another reason why I like to be out in the community in spaces like the Chamber of Commerce or here in Fort Wayne, it's called Greater Fort Wayne Inc. Because I like to remind the decision makers and the stakeholders and the business people that we are a part of a thriving economy. A good library brings people to the community and makes it a desirable place to stay. That we are contributing to the local economy by helping aspiring business people and entrepreneurs with their first big idea. We have people co-working in our libraries. We hear a lot about co-working spaces and they're wonderful. And I always say the library was the first co-working space. We were co-working before it even had a name, right? Yeah. I'm going to, um, before we go to, I'm going to get you guys to tell me what you think the future of, the, of library work is. Um, I'm just going to rattle off some services that I know we have at McCracken or that we that I see that other libraries have because I, you know, I read newspapers and things. <laughs> <laughs> but, and just raise your hand if your library also has the service. Um, copying, cheap copying. Cheap faxing, free Wi-Fi. Um, let's say I know that our library has. Um, we're doing fishing rods now. Um, do you have, say, bakeware or crafting materials that you allow people to check out and take? We have musical instruments. Does that count? Oh my. <laughs> So like a library of things. <laughs> and we have cornhole and lawn darts and <laughs> library of things. And seeds. Love that. New school library lawn darts, right? Not the <laughs> lawn darts of old. <laughs> very safe. Very safe. And you said seeds? We have a seed library. Tammy, doesn't Marshall have a seed library? Did I dream that? We have been working towards a seed library for okay. quite some time and have not made it completely there yet. Ours is just starting up this summer. They are just having their meeting, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, laptops that patrons can check out. Um, does anyone do tablets? I know we don't, but I don't know if anyone did tablets. Um, I think those. Do you have like a law library where they can look up and, I don't know, do their self-divorce? which we have and people have asked me for help. And I'm like, I, I can't help you get divorced, sir. <laughs> I have had, had people ask me to help them, but we do have a law library across the street, so. <laughs> what about tax forms, tax help maybe during tax season? Yeah. Um, and I'll end with what is soon to be something you will hear over and over. Will you have eclipse glasses? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I assume we will. I won't have enough, but I will have some. <laughs> Depends on how um, generous NASA is this this go round. Good point. Good point. Um, I'm going to ask now. Let's look a little bit into the future um, of where we think libraries will go. I this is I worked in the library way back in '95. And then I returned in 2005, and I was amazed that we were checking out uh, DVDs, that we had a computer lab, those, because that had never occurred to me that that would be something my library would ever offer. Um, and on another tip, I remember when um, the seventh book of the Harry Potter series came out. And we had like security around the books. Only certain people <laughs> could touch them. Um, they weren't just out in the population when they were working on them. They had to check them out and check them back in, you know, those kinds of things because that was just a widely anticipated book. They were keeping that sucker under lock and key. So I have two questions for you. Um, do you think we'll ever have any type of material be that widely anticipated again in our libraries? And what do you think will be the future as far as materials that libraries will offer for checkout? Are there things 
even beyond what I'm thinking of, that we have now that we can still we will be able to circulate to patrons. Uh, and Tammy, I'll start with you. Oh, of course you will. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> On the spot. <laughs> um, so the first question wasn't the material. It was what? <laughs> oh, if we're ever going to have anything as popular as Harry Potter again. Yeah. Um, yes, the next book by Tammy Blackwell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> People will be lined up around the building. Now, I I don't know that we will ever see that phenomenon again. That was that was amazing. It was wonderful to live through. It was an amazing time to be working in a library. It was the most probably the most fun. Did y'all just hear that my library is closing in fifteen minutes? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it was wonderful. That was about favorite day of work ever. I sat in a room that we decorated to look like the Gryffindor common room, ate chocolate frogs and read my book with a bunch of teenagers. <laughs> Best work day ever. Um, but no, I don't know that we'll ever see that again. And instead of things to check out as the big change, what I think we may start seeing in public libraries is um, maybe like a revolving office space where on like Mondays you have a social worker who's there and Tuesday there's maybe a mental health person that's seeing people there and Wednesday whatever that we almost become like a shared office space for um, other public institutions. I mean, that's kind of what we're seeing happening now. You know, there are tons of other libraries that are starting to get social workers into the libraries, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what we've been talking about. You know, we're having, you know, mental health screenings at the library. We're having this and that at the library. And I think it may become something a bit more for, more formalized agreements between the library and other organizations that, you know, that it's like designated times that they are here and available to the public. Um, that's kind of where I see that we're going. I can see that. And I've been reading some of especially uh, maybe Washington, Baltimore, or on the East Coast, they have, you know, staff social workers. Um, I've been seeing some of that um, in my reading. Uh, Claire, what about you? What do you think? Um, I definitely think we will not see Harry Potter fervor again in our lifetimes. But I also think that that's because the change in accessibility for where you can get books now is different. So like people do get things from the library or they buy them or they read them on eBooks or they listen to e-audios or whatever. So I don't think we'll see the same level of like a hundred Harry Potters coming in and them all going out straight away. Um, although like I do think book talk is very good at selling books. Last year, our number one circulated book was People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry. So there is still fervor behind different books. Um, I agree with Tammy. I think that for libraries to like move forward and stay relevant, I, I use that not, you know, demeaningly, uh, but to be part of the community is to serve the community that you're in. So if people feel comfortable coming to your space, can you bring them, you know, a different organization or a different service that they are more comfortable accessing in your space than in their space or for whatever reason, um, you know, don't want to be there. So I do think that that is, but I also think that there's room for the fun stuff like the library of things and, and things that people don't think of, like we loan out Apple TVs and, you know, Chromecasts and these things. So I think there's room for both. I think you can, you know, offer those serious services that people are in need of and maybe don't know how to access even. Um, all they know is the library. And then there can be room for the fun stuff too. And I think the library is really good at navigating all aspects of the community. To, well, to the best of our ability, we can't be everything to all people at all times, but we can be most things to most people most of the time. And um, I think the library can continue doing that. I agree with that. I like that. Susan, what about you? So thinking about the question, will there ever be another Harry Potter? I'm going to take it back even further because I've been around for a few years now, been working in libraries for about 25 years. And I remember when Oprah first had her book. And I remember 
Oprah, I was working in Illinois at the time and Oprah was on between three and four, I think. And at 4.01, our phone just rang off the hook with Oprah's latest pick. And I feel like now our media landscape is so cluttered and so noisy. I don't know if the world is centering around one book or one author like that anymore. Okay. So I just don't see that there's going to be that frenzy around one title. There'll always be hits. And I love book talk and the books that are getting a new life through that medium. But I just don't see that mass hysteria over one title. Unless maybe if Harry Styles writes a book, maybe. <laughs> BTS writes a book, maybe. But uh, <laughs> Not so much. Um, as far as the future, I know here in our community, our patrons have told us loud and clear, they always expect us to have materials. They want a deep, robust collection. They wanna be able to come to their libraries and find things on the shelves to check out. So that's not going away. But in addition to that, I also see us developing more destinational spaces. Something I say a lot is yes and. It doesn't have to be either or. Yes, we are going to have plenty of books and other media to choose from. And also we're going to have play spaces. And also we're going to have theater spaces. And also we're going to have beautiful outdoor spaces where we can have programming. So you have that transactional part where people are coming to the library to get something and put it in their hand and take it home. But you're also having that destination kind of placemaking where people are bringing the family for a day. They're going to get their books, but they're also experiencing time together in our play center. Maybe they're outside on the lawn enjoying an art installation or a sculpture garden. Maybe they're using um, our computers on our, in our maker lab. Maybe they're doing a podcast in our sound booth. They're seeing an art installation in our gallery. So you have that breadth and complexity of experiences in one location. And the other thing that I don't see changing anytime soon is the role of librarian as teacher. Mm -hmm. We're not just pointing people in the right direction to something. People come to our libraries and this happens every day. And I know it happens to all of yours. They're literally bringing their device Sometimes in the shrink wrap still, you know, like popping it on the desk here, here's my new Kindle, help me. So our current generation and our new generation of library workers are going to need to be very comfortable using that technology, but also teaching others how to use it. Yes, yes. I've been on the receiving end of a, can you program this Kindle for me? So, <laughs> and not just from my mother. Um, just <laughs> Uh, yes, um, like Tammy, I'm also in the middle of uh, our closing announcements. Uh, do I think there will be another Harry Potter? Uh, I think there will be something similar down the road. Will it be the same? Probably not. Could it be even bigger? Ooh, that'd be that a lot of stars would have to align for something to be that kind of size again. Um, but is it possible? Sure. Um, the future of libraries, I think, uh, I know I learned a lot from the pandemic. Um, to, to take it back a step, um, like Susan, uh, we had to do a lot of evaluating during the pandemic and just rethinking from the ground up. I know when we were doing, uh, during the pandemic, I was in Houston working as the head of outreach. And one of the things we had to do was figure out what kind of outreach and what kind of uh, programming is going to work for people. And uh, I feel like it's the scene from Apollo 13 when they're trying to figure out what all is in the spaceship. Can they can they use to make them like have oxygen when they're starting to run out of air? Just dump all this stuff on the table. It's like, okay, what can we use? And for us, we're trying to think from a very utilitarian point of view that, okay, what does everyone likely have in their house right now. And for most of the pandemic, all of our DIYs, all of our crafts online, almost all of them were designed from the perspective of, are these household items that people have at home that they could put together right now? So all of our, all of our DIY stuff was 
uh, all of our crafting was sponges, gloves, um, medicine bottles to make your own DIY survival pill bottle with your waterproof matches and your extra zip ties and some band-aids. Like if, it, if we could do it on a shoestring and that someone probably had it at home, that's how we did it. Um, going into the future now, I think that remaining utilitarian is probably going to be the future of libraries, making sure that we can provide everything that people need um, because the, the, the line between want and need has grown so much during the digital divide, during the income divide, during this eroding middle class, um, what used to just be a want and now is a need, especially with internet, especially as we are seeing more of these remote jobs. Um, I, the, the, I think the the primary future of libraries is streaming. Uh, I've, I've said this for years and I'll say it again, whoever figures out the price model for streaming, whether it's Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, whoever figures out the model where patrons can use their library card to enter their services, they will flip the industry upside down overnight. The idea that Netflix could say, you can now log in with your library card. I mean, that, that's going to knock almost every other vendor out of town, if not, dis, if not heavily disrupt them. Um, I think that's that's the next big trend I'm thinking is going to happen in libraries. That's what I'm hoping for. Um, it's actually that was, I worked with one of my coworkers designing some of these questions, and that was something that he brought up too, which libraries could stream. And I was like, I do too. <laughs> um, so I wanna thank each of you um, for joining me this evening. I'm gonna go around and I'm gonna go in alphabetical order <laughs> um, and just give me a closing statement either about your library, about library work, um, about how great I am, all of the above. <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, alphabetical order, we're going to start with Ms. Susan. Well, you are fantastic, Kristen. I miss you and Paducah very much. I don't know if you can see in the background, but I have a Paducah coffee mug. Nice, I do. So you're, you're never far from my heart. Um, I just loved my time there. And Justin, you just, and I think you know it, you've just got a gift there in a community and a staff. It's wonderful. And I miss you too, Tammy. <laughs> Learned so much from working in Kentucky and happy to bring that experience here in Indiana. And I just think it's such a privilege to be a public librarian. I had um, some, one, it's been a few years, but someone told me when I was talking about having flu shots at the library, he said, well, that doesn't make sense to have flu shots at the library because people only come to the library for happy reasons. Why would you bum them out with getting a shot at the library? And I said, kindly, but firmly, sir, we see people on the worst days of their life sometimes. Mm -hmm. we see people when they've lost a job, when they've lost a loved one, when they've received a terminal diagnosis and we're there for them during those times as well and I think it's a real privilege um, at the public library every day you see human tragedy and human comedy it's never the same day and the public always is surprising and delightful and I can't imagine doing anything else. Tammy you're up next. Over clamped already okay <laughs> um, just that Public libraries are doing so much right now. They are the center of their communities and um, adapting and learning and trying their hardest. And for those people who aren't using their public library, walk in the door and just ask what's going on. I mean, um, we're actually having difficulty figuring out how to organize the number of events that we have. Um, in a way that people can understand what's going on where just because we have so incredibly much going on and it's constant. Um, we, we slowed down a little during the COVID, <laughs> um, but, but we're really back at it and libraries are amazing. They really are. Um, I walked into my first public library job having no idea, no clue the amount of good 
that libraries do in their communities. Mm -hmm. And here, 16 years later, there it's been life changing. Justin. Um, I, some, some of you who, who have known me for a little while know that I come from a whole family of librarians. Uh, my mom is a retired library director. My aunt is retired Library of Congress. Uh, I've grown up with libraries and, you know, one of my mentors is my mom, who was a library director for, you know, 20 something years. And I, you know, of all the little post-it note wisdom, as I call it, uh, that she handed down, the most important one that really stuck out to me was, you know, no matter what happens, you never leave someone empty handed. If you cannot find what resource they need, you find the person who can. And I think that's the driving force between of community outreach, of being able to have partnerships. It's when someone is in trouble, if you see them and they need help, you help them. Um, there are, there's almost no other game in town where you can come without any kind of expectation, that you can be, you can simply exist. And if you need more help than just existing, that we are there to provide that. And also to make sure that everyone else knows that you can provide those things, especially the big decision makers around town. Being able to not only make a difference in someone's life, but being able to talk about that difference, not just saying to a county commissioner, oh, well, I helped a, I helped a woman uh, and her kids uh, separate and divorce from an abusive husband. Um, that, that's a great success story and I love it, but we also need to be able to explain, we saved taxpayers $8.9 million last year. For every dollar the, of taxpayer money that comes in the library, we're able to put out another $2.28. Uh, not only do we make differences on the personal level, but we also make it on the countywide level that we are able to make life-changing differences uh, just from, from top to bottom. And that, that ties into you don't leave people empty-handed, and you also are able to tell people that you know you, that you don't leave them empty-handed. It's, it, it's, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to tell people that I help make a difference and that I lead a team of life-changing people every day. Oh, I like that too. Uh, Claire. Well, it's so hard to go after all of you with your lovely <laughs> sentiments. Um, I will do a little bit of a personal story. When I was little, we used to visit the library every Sunday and we had our own library cards. And back in the day, Red Republic Library, they printed your name on your library card. So for the longest thing, it was the only, or longest time, it was the only thing in my wallet. And we were allowed to take out three books and one VHS tape that the three siblings had to agree on. And, men, and many years later, you know, after we stopped going every week and, you know, you grow up and your life gets busy and you think that the library is not for you anymore, for whatever reason, I applied on a whim for summer, you know, assistance just when I was um, in college. And now 14 years later, I'm planning summer reading programs that I remember going to. And I'm, you know, seeing people that, you know, retired teachers that I had in the community, or, you know, just being a part of something bigger than yourself, that libraries do create a space and a memory and a time for so many people in so many different ways. And seeing that like in my own life and then seeing it, like, I mean, you all probably see it, the kids that come to story time and then they come and they study and homework help and then they're graduating school and then they're bringing their children. Like it is just a cycle of these people's lives that you see these snippets of. And it's, yeah, it is a privilege to be a part of something that is special in the community and wants to be there and wants to help and wants to find you help if we're not the help. So I just, I, I love libraries and I love everything about them. Oh, well, I, these are all lovely statements. <laughs> and I agreed with all of them because I thought they were all fabulous. Um, but I wanna thank you guys so much tonight for taking the time to talk to me um for agreeing to this program that I just dreamed up out of my head and forced people to do with me <laughs> I appreciate it so very much 
Um, and to those of you out there watching, thank you so much for uh, spending time with us tonight. I hope that you learn a little bit about libraries. I hope that you feel uh, more in love with your library than you already were. And um, I hope you all have a good evening.